Good afternoon, everyone, teachers, friends. It's nice to see you back again today. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and safe and staying indoors in this extended lockdown situation in Sri Lanka. Um, so we're happy to bring you the second of the uh, series of webinars on communication skills with Dale Edwards. And for those of you who joined us last week, thank you. And if you didn't, there is a link to the recording from last week and we'll, we will be sharing it soon. Um, but we've also emailed you, so I hope you've already seen it. Um, and um, if there are any questions, you can use the Q&A box and we will get to it at the end of the session. But also I'd like to ask you all to please, um, at the end of the webinar, Dale will be sending out a feedback form and I'd encourage you to take a few minutes to fill that form because it gives us a, a lot of information as to how we should uh, change or um, or continue webinars in the future and what, what you are looking for as a teacher from us. So it really does help us and it's very useful feedback to have. So please do take a few moments to fill that feedback form. So without further ado, I say hi to Dale. Welcome back, Dale. Hi, Renu. Always good to be back. Yes, it's like nice to have you back on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> well, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you would understand, this is quite the graveyard shift um, when most of you would probably have preferred maybe to lie down a bit. But of course, during this extended lockdown, we perhaps have been a little bit also of that. So um, why not sneak in a little bit of work this Saturday afternoon? Um, so thank you for... Uh, very quickly just shared in the chat uh, uh, the link to last week's webinar if you'd like to catch up on the recording where we looked very closely at grades initial one two and three well uh, today i'm going to be looking at grades four and five now these are relatively we've just got two grades to cover so what i would really like to do is maybe at the end try and take in as many questions uh, related to both uh, the last week's grades, that's initial to three, as well as any questions that you may have with regard to grade four and five. So on that note, let us get started. So this is what we did in our first webinar, in case you missed it and were not there. Um, I'm happy to share this with you. Um, uh, in many respects, I'm gonna be covering a lot of these again today. And then of course, talking about grades four and five. Now, the role of communication skills is an ever increasing and ever changing role. And hence, I'll be talking a little bit about that in a little more detail, particularly in the context of 21st century skills um, that everybody talks about these days. Uh, but just to put and to set this entire series of webinars into a context, um, I'd like to just rewind a little bit and share this with you. Uh, as you know, Trinity College London is an examination board. We operate in 68 countries, and we've been doing that since 1877. The areas of the subjects that we assess are the English language, music, drama, performance, and of course, contemporary music as well. Now, Working with children and learners across the ages and across um, this lengthy expanse of time, we've realized that there are four skill sets that essentially any learner needs to have. And they go in the order of confidence, language skills, transferable skills, and study strategies. And I keep that in the, in the context of one circle with no real end because all of these kind of trickle into another and help us get into the new phase or the next phase of learning within these areas. Now, as you may know, um, in conjunction with what I just mentioned, a lot of our teachers around the world uh, between the ages of three and seven work on building a child's confidence through various um, social learning pathways, including drama. And when they reach the age of about five onwards, we start to work a little closely on language development, the English language development, particularly the conversational and the oral component. This is normally an area which schools 
um, unfortunately, I'm not able to pay attention to with too much of depth, simply because it's just a numbers problem and you cannot cater to 30, 40, 50, 80 students in a classroom um, and give each of them the time of day to speak, to listen and so on. So hence, while we spend a lot of time on writing skills, we often don't spend enough of time on speaking skills. Which brings me to the next phase of development in a learner when they reach the age of seven onwards or thereabouts, they start to express themselves artistically, creatively, uh, they identify with media around them, with film, with song and so on. And hence that's the time when we start to look at subjects that involve communication, delivery, presentation and of course performance. And then of course from the higher ages about the age of 11 or 12 onwards, we start to look at preparing young people, assuming they've built up all these skill sets to get ready for their academic or their professional future, which involves the harnessing of all four key areas of uh, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So that's what we do. In the context of subjects, if I was to put it in a slightly different way, I would tell you that between the ages of three to seven, we do the Young Performer Certificate, which is a drama-based group um, assessment and work. Um, from the ages of five onwards, we work with the graded exams in spoken English, which is JESSE, which I know many of you are familiar with. And then from the age of seven onwards, we look at subjects like communication skills, speech and drama, acting, performance arts, musical theater, and so on. And of course, at the higher ages, we do the integrated skills in English, and as you can see, that has multiple levels as well. And then of course, post 18, you always have the option to take your mastery to a new level in the form of the diplomas that Trinity offers, both performance diplomas as well as teaching diplomas. So we look at today's discussion in the context of the pathway that we always believe is helpful for all learners and certainly for all teachers, because you're not just working on one specific area, it kind of, you need to work on the entire skill set. And at certain points in time, some of them will become a little more needed than the others. So that brings us to what we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about 21st century skills. We're going to look at the syllabus in case you missed it the last time. We're going to look at exams and specifically grades four and five. And then of course, talk about the relevance of Trinity in the larger scheme of things. <clears throat> so let's start over here. The need and importance of 21st century skills. So as you can see, this is an article that I'm citing from the Psychiatric Times of January 14th, earlier this year, which makes reference to this term called brain capital, which is a form of capital relevant to a complex, interconnected and fragile global economy that puts a premium on brain skills and brain health. So brain skills include self-control, emotional intelligence, creativity, mindfulness, compassion, altruism, um, systems thinking, metacognition, and so on and so forth. Now, why does this become so important? Well, because it's a concept that applies not just to us as individuals and human beings, but this very same brain capital <clears throat> when displayed in abundance can be implied at an organizational level, a national level, and of course, at global levels. So when we look at young people and what we aspire to help bring out through education, we oftentimes see that we deep dive into subjects like STEM, which is the science, technology, the engineering, and math. And in the last 25, 30 years or so, there's been a very dedicated and decided evolution of the arts, the humanities, and so on. And some would say that perhaps those are the more leveling subjects for a complex world that we live in. We've seen uh, an outstripping um, in terms of growth of population and people. And hence, we need to also have a better understanding of people's cultures um, and the way one influences the other and life around. And if you would recall in my first webinar, I made reference to the important thing that 
typically traditional education would impart us with a lot of knowledge, but the key element that is very often missing is the ability to do. And that is where skills come in because skills are essentially the ability to not just know, but more importantly, the ability to do. So in this context, 21st century skills, communication skills are very, very important. And I would say almost critical to success in life, success in um, happiness and success in your personal journey that you may be going through. So what are the 21st century skills and what do they include? Well, they include digital literacies, they include the four C's and they include transferable skills. Now, just a quick look at what each of them mean. So as you can logically assume, digital literacy means being able to handle and uh, maneuver yourself through the various digital platforms. But it's beyond just knowing how to open Instagram and Facebook. It's about learning how to thrive in an ecosystem that is digital to be able to make meaning and to create value in that context. So hence the ability to have photo visual literacy, which means that you can look at an image and deduce what it means the ability to reproduce works that you may have seen in an offline mode, but now make it relevant to an online mode. And we all know that this last year's teachers, that's been quite uh, the need of the hour. And many of us rose to that occasion to be able to build this literacy, um, generally all the digital literacies, but in particular being able to make classroom materials um, more uh, amenable to a digital format. And then of course, there's the important thing of the branching literacy, wherein we learn to navigate between non-linear um, digital spaces and move between one area of learning and teaching to another um, to make cohesive, cohesive sense of it all. And then of course comes in information liter literacy, which is where to search for what. In the good old days, you looked at just Google Perhaps today you need to look at Google Scholar or better still, you need to look at a few more uh, deep diving websites and information resources. And finally, of course, all of this takes on a whole new importance in maintaining that social emotional literacy of the various aspects that we are now exposed to, to the digital, digital environment. But we also need to keep in mind, how is this affecting us culturally? How is it affecting us emotionally and socially? So digital literacies is also a new area of learning. Uh, and I dare say a, an area of extreme importance and one that needs its due fair share of importance. But with that being said, <clears throat> a lot of our education and a lot of our development revolves around the four C's. And that really refers to creativity. So we need creativity in education because that is what stirs the imagination and helps release additional processes like critical thinking and making meaning out of new forms and ideas. Similarly, we need critical thinking when not just the ability to reproduce content, but the ability to analyze it, to evaluate it, to interpret it, to synthesize it, and to evolve a creative application or creative use which can help solve a unique problem. Of course, collaboration needs no introduction. We all know what that means, but in the digital environment that we find ourselves today, it requires us to be a little more agile in being able to understand nuance and um, go one step further to be inclusive um, and have equality, diversity, and so on. And finally, of course, communication is simply the transference of meaning and feeling um, in multiple contexts from a cultural context, a psychological context, a physical context, and an emotional context as well. So you can see these are the four C's that help keep us on the straight and narrow in terms of skills. 
And finally, I want to talk about this, which is transferable skills. Now, this very image, I have literally copied it and cited, hence the source, is from the UNICEF's report on transferable skills, which was released in December 2019. And you can see the transferable skills are a magic glue in the center of it all and refer to skills like um, critical thinking, decision making, um, the ability to uh, be adaptive learners, the ability to problem solve, to manage emotions, to have empathy. And those skill sets at the heart of foundational skills, which is arithmetic and uh, reading, combined with job specific skills and digital skills, help us create this right equilibrium to develop transferable skills. And most importantly, for us to be able to use them wisely. So hence, <clears throat> this is a little bit about the 21st century skills. Now, just for your reference, and this is from the World Economic Forum. In 2015, when they interviewed some of the world leaders, business leaders, and they asked them about transferable skills, uh, as you can see, um, they said in 2015, these are the transferable skills that are valid. And 2020, these are the transferable skills that we believe that will be valid. Now, it's very interesting to note that more or less most of them are the same, all right, with the reordering here and there, and with the addition in one particular case, uh, which is cognitive flexibility in the 2020 list. You can see that really what the world is looking for is kind of constant. The question is, are we working towards producing young learners that have these skills? In fact, gone are the days when we talk about traditional education, because I was just reading a report the other day that said 14% of Google's employees, and I dare say these are pretty creative people uh, with talent um, and definitely learning, although it's not structured learning. 14% of their employees do not have um, any high school education, but yet they're able to coexist and make meaning and add value to the world in which we live in. And they're able to do that because they have these skills. So which is why it's important that we as teachers help develop these skills through the tasks that we help uh, build and construct and set learning outcomes to so that they not just develop a proficiency in the subject, for instance, communication, but they also develop at the back of all of this these skill sets, which will always be useful in life wherever they go. Hence, they can transfer these skills in a variety of scenarios. So they say, no matter what job you have in life, your success will be determined 5% by your academic credentials, 15% by your professional experiences, and 80% by your communication skills which I think is the right time and sets the tone to talk about our communication skills syllabus. So here we go. This is the syllabus if you're looking at it. Uh, it's a 2020 syllabus. If you're looking at the digital version, it's a green colored booklet, <clears throat> uh, which will say from 2020. Now, just a note, on, um, the, because this is a subject that deals with communication and because we're at a board that uses English as the language, we assume that in the case of communication skills, that the English language that the candidate uses is already secure and rooted. And just to give a guideline or a benchmark reference, we say the least or the lowest level you want should be is B1. And then of course, from grades three onwards, they need to be a B2. And at grade six onwards, they need to have a C1 level of English. And I make reference to those levels as published by the CEFR, which is the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, which we touched upon a little bit the last time. That is a European body that sets the can-do statements that are attached to each level uh, that demonstrates the proficiency of the speaker when they're using English language and hence benchmarks it at a level. So to deep dive quickly into the syllabus, 
Um, if you are joining us this week for the first time, um, you should know this. Our syllabus is very important in so much as it helped lays out the scaffolding on the basis of which you can teach. So within the context of the syllabus, these are some of the things that it contains. On page three and four, we talk about the relevance of the subject of communication and the 21st century skills that get developed through the use of the syllabus. So hence, as teachers, using the syllabus is firstly your canvas. And you can use and pull and uh, choose whichever learning outcome you want to work with as a learning objective for, let's say, a particular lesson plan or a class. And then thereafter, you can go out, devise your lesson plan to bring that out. So that is essentially what our syllabus is going to do any which way. Um, to talk about the various grades, as you can see over here, these are the grades. So we go from initial all the way up to eight. All right. Uh, these are the recommended ages. Of course, it's just a recommendation. It's not written in stone. Okay. And of course, these are the different levels as per the regulated qualification framework, which is the RQF. Now, when it comes to assessments, this is the way we um, assess and give marks. If you have 64 and below, it's below pass. If you have 65 to 74, it's pass. If you have 75 to 84, it's a merit. And if you have 85 or more, it's a distinction. Now, these exams from grade six onwards um, have a very special significance, particularly if you're looking at studying in the UK. And that is because they could be something known as UCAS points, which is the University College and Admission Services. Now, this is you, a portal through which you apply for higher education or for undergrad in the UK. And if you've done any of our grades six, seven, and eight, be it in drama and music and communication skills, you get points based on your performance that add value in your application process and help you get a better consideration. Similarly, every qualification and every grade um, has its own unique qualification number. And you will find that on page six, where if you look at it closely, this is what you would see. And you can always verify whether this exam has legitimacy and is recognized by going to register.ofqual.gov.uk, which is the body that helps uh, keep um, an overview of all exams that are conducted by English boards. Now, implicit in the training of skills comes the ability of, I don't just know, but I have to be able to do. So hence, at every grade, <clears throat> we've made a recommendation of the amount of teaching hours that there should be, which is basically the instruction that the teacher or a learner with higher ability can now share with you or teach you, and then your ability to independently apply that knowledge or use your learnings by actually demonstrating or practicing. So as you can see, as you progress through the grades, there's a higher amount of learning hours required. And the ratio is one is to four in terms of how much of time should the teacher spend with you and how much of time should you be applying this on your own. And this is what makes our syllabus exceedingly unique because it's finally about being able to use all that you're learning in the real world. And hence we've attached this table known as the total qualification time that it takes to get you through a particular level. So, we start at grade one and we go up to grade eight, as you can see, which is right up to here. And when you look at it in the RQF level column, that's level three. Essentially, this is the high school level. When you finish grade eight, you're approximately uh, 18 years old um, or the equivalent of uh, a 12th grade. And thereafter, we offer diplomas, which could be the equivalent of a grade four. So, sorry, a level four, and of course, a level six, which is the first year bachelor's and the bachelor's level. 
So you can see there are some additional reading material that you can also refer to in the syllabus and how do they take you to various possibilities, not just professional, but higher academic possibilities as well. Now, I mentioned finally that whatever we are talking about is in the con conjunction with skills. So our syllabus very clearly helps develop these skills. We've defined the skill, the meaning, and how the exam task is supporting it. So there you have it in front of you. Which brings us now, of course, to the exams and how does one go about preparing for it? So the support and the, and the construct. So you will find these things also in your syllabus, all right? One is the foundational skills upon which the communication skills syllabus sits. So there are four foundational skills, which is communication, interaction, analysis, and of course, performance. A lot of your talks are presentations and will be held in the context of public speaking. Hence, there's an element of performance in that. Now, on page nine of the syllabus, we detail the learning outcomes grade-wise for all the grades. And each after each relevant grade, we also mention the assessment criteria and the attainment descriptors. So teachers, if you are going to be teaching, it's very, very important to look at this overview from which you should teach. You should have a good understanding of skills to be developed, the learning outcomes of the grade, add to that the assessment criteria and the attainment descriptors to really help you steer, guide your lesson plans and also how to evaluate those lesson plans. So to give you an example, in grade four, these are the learning outcomes that we are looking at. We want students who have reached the level of a grade four should be able to display or demonstrate or use these kind of outcomes or show us these kind of outcomes. Similarly, when it comes to how do we assess these outcomes? We've got the criteria over here and the broad grouping of the skills in which this comes. So this is what I was making reference to a little while ago, which was the foundational skills. Okay, now as teachers, and this is just to veer a little left of what we are talking, um, in terms of teaching and a lesson plan, so this is typically what a lot of teachers choose to do in a lesson. Um, so assuming it's 45 minutes or thereabouts, you would ideally want to um, work your lesson plan such, there, such that there is firstly you presenting or teaching the students something, which is the first P. And thereafter, after you've done that, the students get a chance to practice in a slightly controlled environment with guidance. So you teach, students do, okay, which is practice. You give them some feedback and then they're able to start to produce because it's now they're looking, it's freer practice where they have a better understanding, not just on the basis of what you said, but they also did a, got some corrective feedback from you that now finally they're able to practice more freely, which finally leads to them being able to do that particular task or that particular outcome with a complete sense of ownership and they can personalize it. So this is just something to help you if you're a teacher and you want to know what should, how should your lesson plan go, it should have these four stages, all right? now. I make reference over here to this term called ARC because it's very similar to a concept that was initially referred to or introduced to the world through a gentleman called James Scrivener. And he introduced this topic of in the context of second language acquisition or where English was the second language. And he says, typically a class lesson plan should have some authentic input, which is the teacher's input, 
there should be some restrictive uh, practice, which is where students produce. There should be clarification, wherein uh, students are able to just get feedback as well as to show us a little bit more. It's also very similar to the TTT model, which is um, which could be actually done in a variety of ways, including um, test, teach, test, right? Which means we give the students something to do. We see how they've done. On the basis of how they've done, we then start teaching so that we now have a reference point of where to start teaching from and then give them another test at the end, all right? Or it can also be implied as task, uh, test task. And so it's um, test, teach, test. Um, it could also be task, test, task, or task, test, teach. All right. So don't mean to confuse you. It's very simple. If you understand the simple philosophy behind it is you should give a little bit of input. The child or the year learner should have a chance to try it on their own. You give some corrective feedback. They now try it with a little more confidence. And then finally, after holding their hand a couple of times, they now can personalize it. So that's the logic behind the slide. Now, what you may also want to do is when you're working with bigger classes, you want to kind of keep all the learning outcomes and assessment criteria in one um, column, one below the other. And when you're mapping your lesson plans, you may say, okay, lesson plan number one, I made sure I covered, for instance, the ability of the student to engage in a topic. In lesson two, I touched upon body language. So this way, you know at a glance what all you've done across your lessons, vis-a-vis -vis the learning outcomes, all right? And finally, of course, you can also set this in the context of the attainment descriptors, all right? So like I mentioned, we have distinction, merit, pass, and below pass. This over here explains, this table explains what's the distinction uh, against a parameter that would uh, help you decide whether it's below pass or whether you get a distinction for your skill sets. All right. So just to talk you through one particular example, this particular point over here talks about audibility, clarity, and fluency. So which means we say that it was demonstrated throughout. Over here, a merit says it was demonstrated most of the time, which means not throughout. All right. And here we say at the past level, it was demonstrated some of the time. And here we say, well, it basically showed it was, it was lacking at completely. So you get an idea of how we use a particular uh, area of assessment. And then through the interpretation of words and explanations, you know the different shades of uh, grading, so to speak, which are in front of you. So this is now perhaps when you're working towards the end and you're working towards students getting ready for an exam, you wanna keep those same learning outcomes, but now you wanna see whether they're hitting the distinction uh, attainment descriptors or whether they're hitting merit pass or below pass more often or um, less frequently. You know? So this is something just to help you. Which brings us to the tasks for today. So let's look at grade four task one wherein a candidate gives a presentation that describes a personal interest, challenge, or achievement. And they need to, need to take three minutes for this. And over here, the skills that we're looking at are communication, interaction, analysis, and performance. And for this particular task, a student should stand. Why? Because it is a presentation. So, Typically, what should they cover in those three minutes? Things like, what is this interest they have or the challenge? When and how did it begin? What is so special about this? Any special training or reading material or formation or studying that they had to do to be there in that um, uh, interest? Uh, how have they helped or contributed uh, in any way in terms of by learning this or by having this interest, do they render their service somewhere, all right? And what do their family or what do their folks and friends feel about this interest? And whether they have any special achievements, have they won a particular medal or an award? And 
um, when they look back at this interest and they look back at some anecdotal stories about themselves, maybe they remember a day when perhaps they did something well in this area of interest, or it was a day when there was a learning moment and so on. And then of course, to tell us what they plan on doing next in the next possible stage. Now, as you can see, the examiner thereafter engages the candidate in a discussion to gather further information on the topic. So this is another two minute sit down where after the presentation, the examiner is going to talk to them and say, so did you have any difficulties while you were learning this? Or uh, what did you feel when you engage in your interest? So let's say it's reading. So what does reading do for you? And what kind of books would you like? And so on. And also things like, has it helped you in any other way? And basically there could be any question related to what was presented. So this is grade four task one. Now this comes to a very interesting task, which is grade four task two. This two is a presentation. So you see grade three and grade four, suddenly you're making two presentations. All right, the earlier one was three minutes. This one is five minutes. And here you give a presentation to inspire participation in an activity. And the candidate should even state who their audience is. So how would you typically go about preparing for this task? So step one is identify what the candidate has an interest in. This would maybe reading or a book club or a music club or whatever. Then what are the benefits and advantages of the interest? All right. Can this interest be broadened to benefit many? Can, is there any structure to formalize this activity? Then of course you define who the audience is, you brainstorm your content and you lay out your speech. Now, if you have to use this, let's say as an, as an example of, let's say an outdoor activity and I'm inspiring, let's say I'm uh, from the nature club and I'm talking to all my friends from the book club about joining us on an outdoor trek. I firstly have to identify that I'm talking about an outdoor trek. Thereafter, I talk about some of the benefits of outdoor trekking. So stamina, fitness, nature, fresh air, etc. I talk about um, how this can help with relaxing stress, with having some fun. And I then go on to give them some practical details about what we're planning on doing. Um, I also um, have get into some additional details like what, when, where, why, how are we going to be doing whatever we're doing. And then of course we lay it out with the help of this mind map, which kind of creates clusters of based on the grouping. So let's say one particular cluster over here could be all about why should we go outdoor trekking? One particular cluster over here should be talking about the physical logistics of the trip. Another cluster over here should be talking about maybe the advantages and the benefits. And the other cluster over here could be charitable, charitable cause that is perhaps tied in. So this essentially you will do for five minutes. And after, of course, this, the examiner will chat with you again. Now, this is something that I have used. In fact, it's something that I actually developed for a client of mine, a corporate client where um, they make something known as elevator pitches. Um, it's a mutual fund company. Um, and very often they get two minutes to kind of pitch their whole idea using um, um, in a very quickly uh, laid out way. So we devised something like this. It's a persuasive sheet. And essentially what the way to use this is um, you start from the bottom where you identify what your call to action is. So the purpose of you speaking is what? To get someone to go on a trip with you. So that would be over here. The action or the call to action is to get my audience to go on this trip this following Sunday. So it's a declarative statement. And thereafter, I work backwards from go to point number two, and I state what's in it for them. So we should go for this trip next door. I'm asking you to come for this trip next Sunday because one, it's uh, an extended weekend and this will be a great way for you to connect outdoors to blah, 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 three, blah, 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 blah. And then I go one step further and I 
highlight what I'm saying or the benefits by planting ideas, idea one, idea two, idea three, defined in three sentences. And while I've now wet the appetite, so to speak, I then flesh out each of the ideas in a little more detail by perhaps adding maybe two or three sentences for each of the ideas that I mentioned over here. And when I'm done with that, I sum up my ideas again by talking about three values that are attached to the three ideas. And then of course, I think about what am I gonna say that is gonna grab their attention? Am I gonna say, guys, I'd like to, to hear me out because what I say to you in the next five minutes is gonna make a difference to the next five years of your life. And you say, I grab their attention. And thereafter, so this is a lovely process to use. It's just my uh, contribution to you uh, as a fellow teacher. Yeah, so I use this process, it might be helpful to you. That's why I'm sharing it. Um, and of course, when it comes to delivering, you start delivering your speech from the top down. So this way, when you're planning, you plan from bottom up. And when you're delivering, you go from top to bottom. Now in between over here, you'll see these little things called transitions. This is where you have an opportunity to make this your own. This is where you perhaps in transition one are introducing maybe a quote, or you're talking about, you know, once upon a time, this is what happened to me. You're talking about a story, or you've got a little witticism somewhere there, or you've got maybe a good uh, uh, story. So stories, examples, quotes, witticisms, humor, all of those come in, in the transitions between these points that makes what you are saying 100% you. They say, by the way, 90% of adult communication is persuasion. So if you can do this well, you pretty much can do the anything else you want in the world. Now, let's move to grade four, task three. Here I'm talking about the reflection. So like you, like you would have seen, as our syllabus is not just about do, 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 all right? We wanna see you know why you're doing something. We want you to think about it and understand what did you do or how can you do something better? And that only comes through reflection, which is why the syllabus is so real world or so relevant. So the examiner engages the candidate in discussion about the presentations. The discussion focuses on how the candidate prepared for the presentation and how vocal skills were used to communicate ideas, including the use of pause, emphasis, variations in phrasing and pace. This, my dear teachers, is why I always say that communication skills is not a subject by itself. It is the other side of the same coin. And that coin is the one which talks about speech and drama on one side and communication skills on the other. And I always uh, like to put it in this way. Communication skills is about having something to say and speech and drama is all about how to say it. So if you master these two, all right, and if you've done speech and drama, then you've already created this awareness in your students about how pausing has made a difference. Was it a pregnant pause? Was it a dramatic pause? Was it a pause for a tongue in cheek humorous moment? Or was it pause for grave, somber uh, inflection? So this is a chance that you could you explore all of that in speech and drama, but now they get a chance to use it with their own speeches. That is why communication skills go so well with speech and drama. Now, so just to give you an example of how I would prepare or how I would offer you guidance, if you're preparing uh, for this particular reflection task, one is you should be able to talk to the examiner about firstly, how did you build up your, uh, how did you choose your topics? Thereafter, how did you brainstorm it? How did you lay out your speech, all right? Which is these three steps from the previous slides. And then of course, talk about emphasis, pause, pace, tone, pitch, etc. cetera. And quickly just caught a glance of a question. Is it possible to alternate between exams of communication skills and speech and drama? Yes, please do that teachers. All right, so a lot of my own personal students all right, sometimes I start with them at the age of five and six. So first I would perhaps, depending on the child, okay? So I would then maybe start with, 
speech and drama initial. Why? Because they are meek. It's their first time. They're not so sure what to say. So it's learn something by heart and for the first time hear their voice publicly. So I do speech and drama first. And then once they found that little bounce in their step, maybe the next time I'd get them to talk about their favorite objects. So I do communication skills. And maybe not repeat the grade, maybe I do grade one now. And this way, when you take your children through an area of discovery, maybe starting at the YPC, doing a little bit of Jesse, you don't have to send them up for a Jesse exam, but so often you're working with children where their English may not be very well rooted. So you want to do some lessons around strengthening English. They don't have to do the English exam. So some in my particular program that I normally do for about 25 to 32 weeks, depending on what I'm doing, I would, I would combine all of these. And then look closer towards the end of the uh, sessions to see which exam would best fit my student today, this year. And this way we have a progressive way of rolling forward. Okay, so moving ahead, um, we're talking now about grade five task one. I, um, this, where, this is where you give a presentation in support of a particular cause or charity. So again, very similar to grade four task one, identify what, that, what your interest is, how do you develop a cause around it? Um, for example, reading to blind children. It's a social cause, it's giving of time, it's empowering the blind, it's opening up the world of imagination of blind children. Where are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Uh, what, when we get there, shall we do? Uh, who am I talking to? My members of the book club. Again, details, all right? Because it's presentation in support of a particular cause or charity. So what is the cause? How is it going to be beneficial? Who am I going to talk to about it? What will we do when we get over there or for this cause, um, et cetera? All right, again, questions that the examiner will ask you will be all related to what you presented, okay? Now, uh, which brings us to how would you prepare this? So you saw the six step process earlier. Uh, when you're preparing for grade five task one, um, I use a technique known as free listing, brainstorming, clustering, webbing, and mapping, okay? And what you're seeing over here is just a mind map, but it's a process that starts with free listing. How do you even arrive at what your interest is? All right, so normally you realize free listing is an exercise which you do, which will typically elicit, you'll start to see a theme running through what you said. And then you realize, oh, okay, so this person is inclined more towards the outdoors, or this person is inclined more towards something creative, getting their hands into it. So very often you need to, uh, help young learners develop that ability to uh, to de dig deep into their recesses of their mind to know what they want to talk about. Now, in terms of building a persuasive speech, you've all heard of the great Greek uh, philosopher Aristotle and his three rhetorical appeals, which talk about ethos, logos, pathos, and the fourth one, which I like to add, which is called kairos which deals with the timing of it all. Uh, of course, it was not part of Aristotle's theory. Um, but again, um, yeah, this is something that you will go up and read up on your own. I'm sure I'm not talking about a brand new invention. I'm sure you already know what I'm referring to. So this should have helped you by now. So again, I would use my six step process in anything got to do with persuasion, which brings us now to grade five task two, where they do a reportage. So I'm actually taking this out from page 55 of the syllabus. So you can read this in your own convenience to know what I'm referring to over here. But here the candidate delivers a current news story as if for radio, podcast, or TV. So here the candidate should stand, okay? Why? Because this is part of the presentation. But if you're doing it for radio or podcast, which means you are doing it pretty much sitting quietly in a room somewhere, you can actually read it off a script, but you want to ensure that it's not being delivered in a boring way, which suggests you're reading it off a script. All right, so you can have a script, but you want to keep all the vocal dynamics alive to make sure it is interesting enough. You could also do this reportage as if you were doing it, you were a field reporter for a television channel. And while you are covering something, you are also making a reference to the audience to look over 
your right shoulder because the cameraman is panning something for you to see. And at the same time, you're also covering a story, which brings us to how would you cover a story? So if you're doing a reportage, typically any story has different angles. And to those angles, you need to get some sources and some quotes. All right, why? Because they will add perspectives. So for instance, this unfortunate lockdown that the whole world is going through has had some really, really tragic elements to it. On one hand, we've got a chance to appreciate our families more. There's a little bit of downtime, but it's been at a pretty heavy cost. In India, I was reading an article this morning, so many children have lost parents, in many cases become orphans. Now that's a different perspective. So similarly, there's an economic perspective or psychological perspective, um, socioeconomic perspective, a cultural perspective. Oh, it's, so any story, you can look at what that perspective is. You can then see how you're gonna augment it with visuals and sounds, all right? And finally, of course, you will then choose the media either as a presentation or production, and you will either make it a podcast or a televised um, newscast. Now, this is just a quick reference of how to create a reportage. For the record, I'm not a big fan of using Wiki as the ultimate source for the simple reason that normally that's just a, a pollution of a lot of ideas put up together. But this particular link, I happen to like. That's why I'm sharing it with you on how to create a reportage. So that brings me now to grade five, task three. And here you can see, again, it's reflection time. So at this level, the tasks are show us what you can do and then tell us what you did. Why did you do it? So it's a lovely blend. Once you start to have this, it truly will help them develop what I consider to be the truest um, reflection on communication, which is, do you have something to say or do you have to say something? I think Plato put it quite nicely in his words where he said, wise men say something because they have something to say and fools because they don't. So it's a lovely underlying theme to keep when you're working while developing the subject of communication skills. So that brings me to the end of today's session. And of course, just to let you know, why should you do the Trinity assessments? Well, because we are the leading board when it comes to assessing performance and communicative exams that involve language and performance, period. But more than that, right? We've, we've been doing it for a while, but for as a teacher, you will not find a more liberating syllabus to work with. As teachers, we certainly don't want the humdrum mundane thing of follow someone else's lesson plan. It's boring, right? But yes, show me what the cornerstones should be or the pillar should be. And now let me help lay the flows up one by one. And that's what the syllabus will allow you to do. So I'm now gonna take questions and I'm gonna stop sharing. Renu, will you please step in and help? Yes, of course, yes. So there's one question that's been up here for a while. Um, uh, this is in regard to the extensive teaching of communication skills experience that you have. Sri Lankan kids or even adults who are exposed to these exams tend to use rote or by hearting to get by task two or three. I applaud Trinity's new rule, but it, it isn't a real, of making it more conversational or natural approach. Please advise us as to how we can prepare the candidate for this pass, uh, part without um, them reaching for that crutch. Uh, I wish I could tell you it's as simple as giving you an answer just now, but I will tell you this much. Um, when I train teachers, one of the first things that I always do is I say, um, you know, we as human beings are guided by something that we would call a true north, wherein whatever we feel, whatever we say is anchored and is rooted in beliefs. All right. The belief of is it good? Is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? And beliefs manifested in multiple times become values. And when those values start to get shared, they become attitudes. 
Now, if you had to ever teach someone this, for instance, let's say you're trying to get someone to talk about honesty. Now they will tell you, yes, the standard things, honesty, cliched things like honesty is the best policy and all that stuff. Question is, and I use this as a brainstorming technique. I say, listen, when I say red, you say what? So I say red, they say blood. I say uh, chalk, they say board. I say honesty, they say, hmm. So now that hmm is what I really want because why did the hmm come out? So what do you think about honesty? And then that starts the discovery. So teaching this can be exceedingly a lot of fun. All right, I do hope someday I can do some, something with you as a teacher. Um, uh, uh, or to help you in your practice. But essentially, that is what you should really be doing, getting down into the intrapersonal communication, because that's where it's sitting all, and then from there, building it out. And as you rightly said, you know this thing about rote learning, sometimes it's just, uh, so I always say, in, in methods of speech delivery, one is learning by rote, all right? Um, two is um, producing a huge manuscript and reading from it, which is perhaps even worse. Um, three is by using notes, all right, bullet points, but your wording in your language to highlight the bullet point. And fourth is running completely extempo. Now you got to combine ideally three and four, but it doesn't happen overnight. It starts with baby steps and it can be done. The important thing is to realize that learning by rote is artificial. And if perhaps people are feeling that leaders or when they look at them, they're speaking also confidently, no, no, no. They're aided by the very best of technology, including uh, teleprompters that are invisible. So the, we encourage you to use visual aids. We encourage you to use visual pointers. We understand that real communication is not delivered at 180 words a minute, but more like 140 words a minute, which allows you to pause to think, not just you as the speaker, but even the audience to pause to reflect. You know, so I, this is something that will, it's a little bit of a work in progress. And okay. some of those uh, those techniques that you talked about, I think were really good too. the brainstorming and the, um, you know, the, the, the table that you had, um, because obviously that sort of encourages students to come up with their own ideas, I think, rather than the teacher sort of writing the speech for them. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So teachers, please do not write speeches for your children. Yeah. All right. You're going to handicap them even further. All right. I understand it might be slow beginnings, but get the approach correct. Thereafter, you'll not have a turning point. And this is why I always talk about communication skills as the need of the hour uh, over and above speech and drama. Uh, I mentioned this, I think the last time in Bombay, we have the maximum number of Trinity exams in the world. And I'm based in Bombay. Um, I've seen all the kids over the years, the last 20, 30 years, all do speech and drama. So they all sound brilliant. Or it, they can roll their R's and it sounds so regal. But the minute they have to say something that comes from within, there's that magnificence is lost. I'd much rather someone have their thoughts together and then teach them how to roll their R's, all right? Because then you're getting the right order to the horse and the cart. Yes, great. Uh, okay, so we have... Um another is is the ltcl going to be introduced as a digital exam soon um we don't know yet um, no, don't know yet also because the ltcl has a written component so um and you know that for sure so right now we still don't have the answer to how to do the written component in a digital format what perhaps may happen is that we could get you to do uh, the written exam the minute we start doing music theory exams uh, that's when you could start to do it. Um, there has honestly been some talk about it going digital, um, but we're not just sure how much. And I know it's work in progress, but I cannot comment on when it will happen. Okay. And on the chat box, we have someone asking yeah. about grade eight Jesse, a student who has done grade eight Jesse. Um, what is the next step that you would recommend? So Jesse actually goes to grade 12. That's the, the graded exams for Jesse do, does go up to grade 12. So it really depends. Dale, what is your recommendation? I mean, I think it depends if the student wants to continue and be an English language teacher, then there are other diplomas such as CERT, TESOL and uh, products like that, that they could uh, perceive. Sure. So let me, let me put this in perspective. The Jesse and the ISE exams 
are English proficiency exams. They are not skill exams. They are an exam that finally, when, when you see your certificate, it basically says that, yeah, you did well and your language is now at CEFR whatever dot dot level. So it's, it's proof of proficiency that your English is good enough as a user. It has got nothing to do with teaching and it has got nothing to do with, it's not treated as a vocational skill the way the communication skills exam is treated. All right. So as a student, typically what your student should be doing after grade eight is if I was to kind of marry the two, I would say a grade eight in uh, community in Jesse would be uh, approximately a grade five um, in communication skills or maybe a grade four in communication skills. And yes, you're absolutely right. We do not have diplomas in Jesse, um, but you do have the option of diplomas in um, communication skills and speech and drama. Now, just for you as teachers, and this is just for your information, Renu just made reference to this. If you'd like to have a teaching diploma in English, then you should be doing the CERT TESOL, um, which is a level five qualification, or you could do the DIP TESOL, which is a level seven qualification. Just a little bit of a heads up. These are not self-study diplomas. These are diplomas that come through an accredited center. There are a couple of centers that do it online in Barcelona, in there's one in India. Um, and I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure if there's one in Sri Lanka. Um, but you, so you can do this online and it's not very difficult. It takes a little bit of time about uh, the cert TESOL should take about two months um, and you can have that qualification, but that's truly an English language teaching qualification at an international level for teachers of speakers where English is the second language. Great. Okay. So let me now quickly read through this. Uh, maybe we should go bottom up. With reference to reportage uh, to ask in grade five, may the student deliver a current news article from a newspaper, news magazine? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, this is just to understand how things stand. How successful are candidates in getting a distinction? How did I lose that? In Mumbai. getting a distinction in communication skills in Mumbai and in, and in Sri Lanka. So well, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's not rocket science. It's quite, quite straightforward. Um, I've had... Um, any distinctions in Sri Lanka too were very yeah I, I do know one thing Sri Lanka has a ton of distinctions in speech and drama um, all I can tell you is teachers please start the subject and as I saw this very nicely asked someone asked can you do this alternating between speech and drama and communication yes you could more importantly if you're a teacher of English and you now want to have the, the skill of communication assessed then you should be doing a communication skills exam, all right, um, beyond, over and beyond a Jesse exam, which is a language proficiency exam. So I hope I've conveyed that clearly. Um, is it possible to alternate exams? Yes, I understand that. Love this layout. Thank you. Could you please explain what is meant by transitions? I think I did that. Um, it's not compulsory. It's um, no, so I actually got a couple of mails after the last webinar as well. No, using visual aids is not compulsory at all. And I want to be also go one step further and say, when one talks about making a presentation, you are the presentation, not PPT or not PowerPoint or not Microsoft. You are the presentation. Some of the most successful TED Talks ever delivered in fact, I do that sometimes as a series with some of my students is when we look at the insights from Ted in the early years, you'll see some of the most powerful speeches had nothing to do with the presentation. In fact, did not even come to the topic for the first six minutes. It was just storytelling and building that awareness. Of course, those are 18 minute speeches, but bottom line is um, you're, you would use a visual aid if it's going to augment and add value to what you're doing. Please don't get worried about, I have to use a visual aid. No, you don't. But you will realize in certain topics that you may choose or certain areas of complexity, a picture paints a thousand words, in which case you do want that picture by your side. But let that be driven by need rather than by force. Okay, so I think we've got all the questions. If there's anything else, um... You have actually, we're over time, but. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so sorry. I'm going to very quickly just share with you a link for the feedback, please, teachers. That's the only way you can let Renu and me know how we did. And more importantly, what more we need to do. So that's the link that has come your way in the chat box. Please click on that, teachers, and tell us how we did and what more we could perhaps do, or if there's something more that you'd like us to explain. By the way, the next one is going to be a little bit of a heavy one because it deals with some pretty sophisticated tasks. There is a huge jump between grades five and six in communication skills. All of a sudden, it now becomes about communication, the subject where you're talking about job interviews and business plan presentations and advertising and communication in a social context, in a cultural context. So next week, please do tune in. Uh, just to send you the registration link in case you haven't registered for uh, next week's webinar. That's the link over there. And um, I hope that's really helpful. Of course, if you need any help, just drop me a line and I'll try and do whatever the best I can to help you. Great. Thank you so much, Dale. All right. Yeah. Okay, just uh, for your reference, I'm going to post the last link in, which, is, which was by my first link, really which is what Renu has put together and hosted for last week's webinar, in case you want to catch up on grades one, two, and three, uh, including the initial. That's the link over there. You can watch it on YouTube. And I look forward to seeing you back next Saturday, provided, of course, you stay safe and stay indoors and take care of yourselves. And on that note, I'm going to say bye. Have a lovely weekend, um, a quiet weekend. Um, but I will see you next Saturday. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.